I'm going to begin reading Hebrews 13, 7. It says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Let's bow our heads. Lord God, we just thank you for this beautiful Sunday morning, God. And I pray, Lord, that you will stir every heart this morning, God. And I pray that you will open our hearts to your word this morning and that you will speak to every heart, that every heart feel challenged this morning to be the church that you have called us to be. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, we all said, as you're seated, the title of my message is Live the Legacy. Live the Legacy. And we have, I want to tell you a little bit about our ministry because we have a variety of people here this morning. Um, But the Ministry of Victory Outreach isn't a new church. The church you are sitting in today isn't a new church. But this is a movement. We have been creating this legacy now for going on 51 years. Give God a hand for that. Because it started with humble beginnings in East LA. And what's so amazing is the the beginning, the pioneers of this movement with Pastor Sonny and Sister Julie, the original vision for Victory Outreach was, let's take East LA for Jesus. And so they would have posters and signs, and and their posters and signs said, East LA for Jesus. And they would chant, East LA for Jesus, East LA for Jesus. And from there, God said, you know what? You guys are bigger than East LA. We're going to take East L.A. You may be a small group of people. Oh, but you have big faith inside of you. And he expanded that. Then they began to believe for California and began to launch out churches all over California with simple people. Simple people. Uh, We have a beautiful, rich history in Victory Outreach. And so took California, and then they began to believe for the entire world. And at women's convention, it was so cool because most of the speakers were were international speakers. Speakers from all over the world who speak different dialects, who look different, talk different, act different. But what's so amazing is we all have the same heartbeat. We all have the same vision. And that vision is to take the inner cities of the world. Now, church, you're not an ordinary church. And if you walked in here this morning and you're like new and I saw a lot of first timers, I want to let you know that this is no ordinary church. But this is a church that God has given a mandate to. And that mandate is to go into all the world and give hope to the inner cities and every single continent. How many of you love our vision? We're not an ordinary church. But God has given us a mandate to reach drug addicts, to reach their families, to reach hurting people of the world. And one of the surprising things that took place at Women's Convention is I asked the women, I said, how many of you come from drug addiction and and, uh, don't come from drug addiction, don't come from gangs, don't come from uh, that type of lifestyle? And you know it was about 60% of the women that never were addicted to drugs, never in gangs, never hardcore, never around the streets, and about 40% that were hardcore. And you know what? I, I, think, I think it's a beautiful thing because I am a child of an ex-drug addict. And how many of you know that when my dad got saved, a curse was broken? When you got saved, a curse was broken. You didn't give your life to God so that your your kids could be hooked on drugs too. Get into gangs too. You wanted a curse to be broken. 
We're creating a legacy. Yeah. And it was so beautiful to see that. And I said, I represent that generation. I was never hooked on drugs, that, that, that was never in prison, that never was in gangs. But you know what? I have a heart for hurting people. I have a heart for the drug addict. I have a heart for the gang member. I have a heart for those who have been in prison. We have the same heartbeat. We have the same heartbeat. And what's so beautiful, not only do we have the same heartbeat, we have the anointing. There is a special, I want you to understand this church, there's a special anointing on this ministry. We carry a special anointing to go into the inner cities of the world to be a light in dark places. I want you to understand that because whether you have, have been hooked on drugs or you don't even have a testimony, if you're part of this church, Victory Outreach, and you say, this is my church, and you've planted yourself here, I want you to know that you have an anointing to go out to the darkest places and bring hope to be a light, to be salt of the earth. That, that's what God called us to be in and called us to do. And I don't believe he called us and saved us and delivered us to just sit in a pew. I don't believe that. I believe that when he saves you, delivers you, transforms your life, I believe when that takes place in a man, when that takes place in a woman, oh, he also places purpose over your life. And he gives you an anointing in your life to preach the good news. And my Bible says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. It says to be a light in dark places, to be salt of the earth. What does salt do? <laughs> I love the Menzo. They give me all the answers. It changes things. Light brings light to dark places. And how many of you know we have a city here that has a need? If you drive up the street five minutes, you will see a need. Actually, let me back up. If you walk out our door, you will see a need in this city. And Easter is coming up, church. And if I have a church that says God has saved me, God has delivered me, God has transformed me, God has healed me. If God has really done something in your life, you will want to be a light and a witness to somebody else who needs Jesus. And if ever there's a time for us to rise up as a church and be a witness to somebody, and, and it's not complicated. And sometimes we hold back because we get intimidated and we feel like it's complicated. You know what all it is is doing is saying, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. It's just going up to somebody and just sharing what God has done in your life. Just, just carrying yourself different. How many of you know we have the fruit of the Spirit? Yeah. When we get saved, oh, the Holy Spirit gets a hold of our life. And then all of a sudden we should. This fruit of the Spirit should be radiating through our lives, right? What are the fruits of the Spirit? Love. How many of you have love in your life? Joy. How many of you have joy in your life? Oh, that when people look at you, they just say, wow, you look happy. There's something different about you because it's not fun working at this job. But you look so joyful and happy every day. Where do you get that from? Those are open doors to be a witness. Then you can say, actually, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus is the joy of my life. Love. We are called to be an extension of God's love to a hurting world. People should feel the love of God. You know, for many people, you're the only Jesus they're going to see. Yeah. Talk about it. 
You're the only Jesus some people will see. There's people that will never go to church. But you know what? When they see you, they should see Jesus radiating through your life. Love, joy, peace. You know, when, you're, when you have God in your life, there's no reason to walk around with fear, walk, walking around with no peace. Because we have Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit working in our life. We are able to attain peace in our life. We don't have to have those sleepless nights. Because Jesus is in our life. All the fruits of the Spirit should be radiating through our lives. And God has given us a beautiful, beautiful ministry, a beautiful mandate. He has also given us promises. The first promise is a promise to us. He's given us a promise. Isaiah 45, 2 and 3. It's a promise that says, these are all the things I'm going to do for you, church. These are all the things I'm going to do for you, Victory Outreach San Diego. This, these are all promises for you and that you will know I am going to do all these things in your midst. And I want to read it to you. Isaiah 45, 2 and 3 says, I will go before you and level the mountains. That doesn't excite you, huh? If that doesn't excite you, you haven't had a mountain in your way. But that excites me because it's saying, I will go before you. And that mountain that's in your way, I'm going to level that mountain. I'm going to work on your behalf. I will break down gates of bronze. How many of you know it's hard to break down gates of, bro gates of bronze? But he said, I will break that gate down. And I will cut through bars of iron. Men that work with iron, you know it's not easy to cut through bars of iron. I will give you treasures out of darkness. I will give them to you. Hidden riches and secret places. That, and then it says that you may know. When I give you these treasures, you better know that I, the Lord who called you by your name, am the God of Israel. And has he been faithful to this promise, church? Has he been faithful to give us treasures out of darkness? If he has delivered you from drug addiction, I want you to stand right now. If he has healed you, I want you to stand. If he has healed your body, stand. Oh, if he, if he has delivered you from suicidal tendencies, I want you to stand and give him some praise. Don't just stand. You stand and give him praise because he has been faithful to every promise. He has been faithful. He has been, has he been faithful to his promise to give us treasures out of darkness? He has given us thousands upon thousands of treasures out of darkness in every country and every continent. He has blessed this movement. And he's used simple people. Simple people. Remember your leaders. Remember your leaders and imitate their faith. This ministry has, have, have, has pioneers that help pioneer this ministry. Pastor Sonny, Sister Julie, a simple couple that was simply willing to say, God, use us. Use us. Whatever you want to do through our lives, use our lives to impact people. Because they loved God and loved people. They were willing to lay down their lives. Then we have other pioneers. How many of you remember Pastor Ed? One of our elders that went on to be with the Lord. Pastor Steve Pineda, another elder of ours that went on to be with the Lord. Pastor David Martinez. These are men that had a certain spirit about them. And I call it a spirit of a pioneer. 
They had a spirit of a pioneer. And you know what we need today, church? We need that, the same spirit of a pioneer that they had. That's what we need to rise up in us today. It's a do, I'll do whatever it takes kind of spirit. It's a kind of spirit that says, give me souls lest I die. They didn't care about material things. They didn't care about the, the, the things of this world. All they cared about were souls. Give me souls lest I die. But sometimes we lose that urgency. We lose the urgency and instead of give me souls lest I die, it turns into just give me, give me, give me. And we go before the Lord with the deserving spirit. We lose the gratitude in our life. What happened to the gratitude? That those days when you were just grateful to be off drugs, when you were just grateful you weren't depressed anymore, when you were just grateful that Jesus saved your life. We need the spirit of a pioneer back. Consider your leaders. We need to consider our leaders and imitate their faith. We have a rich history. This isn't just a community church. This isn't just a storefront church. This isn't just the church down the street. Oh, but this church is part of a global movement with the mandate from God to reach the treasures of the world. And God wants to use you. I want you to tell your number, God wants to use you. Follow me. Follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. But you know what he does? He gets us. And the enemy wants to divert us. And he wants us to imprison us. And you know how he imprisons many of you? The prison of offense. And he says, let me just get them distracted a little bit. Let me get their attention off of the fact that, that Jesus saved them, that Jesus put joy in their life, restored their marriage, healed their body, rescued them, their life. And let me put their attention on the prison of offense. Let me, let me get them to a place where they're offended by everything. Remember, it was give me souls lest I die. Now it's give me, give me that deserving spirit. That deserving spirit that the enemy grips us with. And then we start getting offended by things. Walking around, oh, he didn't talk to me right. Walking around, and the, and the women, you too. <laughs> oh, who does she think she is? You don't talk to me like that. You know, she texts me with all caps. <laughs> and we get offended. Offended. And it can get to the place where you're offended by every little thing. And it could get, the enemy wants it to get to the place where you don't even want to go to church because you're so offended by everything. And you don't realize the devil's trolling you. That's what my kids call it. They say, don't let anybody troll you. And I go, what does that mean? They go, it's like when somebody's controlling you. We let the devil troll us. Get in our mind. And we get our attention off gratitude and thankfulness and worship and praise. And all of a sudden, our minds on being offended and upset and bitter and angry. And we got to check ourselves, church, because it's not about us. It's not about us. I'm going to say it again. It is not about us. Tell your neighbor it's not about you, baby.
It is not about you. It is not about us. But you know why he saved you? To be a light to someone else. He saved you because he had an assignment for you. He saved you because there's people, you have some co-workers at your job that need Jesus. He saved you because there's a little boy down the street from your house that needs Jesus. He saved you because there's hospitals near your house that people need healing. He saved you to be a light in this world. And we have a city in San Diego church. There's a big need in our city. There are hurting people in this city. People that right at this moment that we're sitting in church that are contemplating suicide in this city. People that right at this moment, there are people in this city that are about to overdose on drugs. Right at this moment, there's young girls, young girls giving themselves up. There's young kids that need a healing that are in the hospital bed, that need somebody to come pray over them. There's children that their parents are hooked on drugs and And they're trying to be kids and they're seeing their parents get drunk and high and partying. They're lost. And here we are, stuck on ourselves, prisoned by our offenses. The devil has you all chained up. And instead of extending your arms in love to a hurting and dying world, oh, he has you all chained up thinking about yourself all day and all night. He's called us. He saved us so that we could be a light to somebody. Luke 4, 18 and 9 says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has called me to preach good news to the poor. Oh, to set the prisoner free, recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed and proclaim the year of salvation. That's the God I serve. That's the God I serve. That's the spirit my God has. And that same spirit is in you. The resurrection power is in you. You have the power to go out and preach the good news to a hurting world. And I pray, I pray that we, I have challenged you this morning because we're approaching Easter Sunday. And not one of us should come here by ourselves. There is not one of us that should come here just thinking about me, me, me. But every single one of us should come with an army of people. An army of people that they have influenced to be in the house of God. To get hope for their situation to meet Jesus. Many people that love God and love people because that's what this ministry is all about. That is what this ministry is all about. And I want to go to our second promise and as, as the worship makes their way up. He has given us a second promise over this ministry. The first promise was all the things that he promises to do for us. But when I read this second scripture, the second promise scripture, when I read it, I said, wow, God, these are all things you're requiring of us now. The first 50 years were things that you said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you. I'm going to do for you. But going into this next 50 years, he's saying, these are some things I'm requiring of you now. 
because there's a whole other generation on the rise. And you know who that generation is? That's your children. That's their children. That's your legacy. Consider your leaders. Imitate their faith. We have pioneers that were selfless, all about saving souls, all about equipping the saints, all about the ministry. That's living the legacy. That's what living the legacy is all about. Let's read the second promise, Isaiah 54, 2 and 3. It says, enlarge the place of your tent. I want you to look around. We have to enlarge the place of our tent here. I don't know if we have much more room here, and I know that we don't have any more parking. Enlarge the place of your tent. That's what he's telling us to do. Tell your neighbor, we need to enlarge the place of our tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Pastor Sonny Sr., his big word right now is stretch. He keeps saying, that's the word of the year, to stretch. I want you to stretch right now. And stop doing this feel-good stretch. <laughs> if you go to the gym and you have a trainer, we have a few trainers here. And they won't give you the feel-good stretch to do. Pastor Algie, show us the, the real stretch. Come up and show us how to stretch properly. <laughs> because you know what? Many of us have been doing the feel-good stretch for way too long. We need to stop doing the feel-good stretch. <laughs> yeah, does it, does it hurt? See, when you stretch properly, it should hurt a little bit. But you know what? Many of us, you're, you're okay. You're good, Pastor Aldi. <laughs> Many of us, we've been doing that feel-good stretch. And God's saying, stop doing that. Stop playing church. Stop giving that little bit. Stop doing that feel-good stretch. And he's calling his people yes. to stretch. The kind of stretch that hurts a little bit. The kind of stretch where you're like, ow, that hurt. <laughs> he's calling us to stretch. Not just for the sake of stretching, but he's calling us to stretch and to feel the pain of the stretch because there are other people, hurting people he wants to add to this church. But it's going to require something of us, church. It's going to require us to get out of our comfort zone and to stretch a little bit. And then the next thing it says here in Isaiah 54, 2 and 3, do not hold back. Do not hold back. This is the spirit of our pioneers here. They didn't hold back. And God's saying, I've been faithful to you this 50 years. But if you're going to see what I want to see for you in this next 50 years, you're going to have to do a few things for me. Because I want to bless you. And I know I blessed you this 50 years. Oh, but it doesn't even compare to the blessings I have for you, Victory Outreach, in this next 50 years to come. But we can't hold back. No holding back. 
Many of you, you hold back with your finances. When they come up here and they give a beautiful speech on giving, oh, you give your little crumbly $20 bill and you think you're doing big things for God. Holding back on your finances, holding back on your gifts. Some of you sing and you don't come up here and sing for the Lord. I believe there's preachers here. I believe there's evangelists here. There's gifts in you, but you hold back. And he's saying, no more holding back. Because it's no coincidence he brought you here today. It's no coincidence he could have taken you to any church in this city. But guess where he brought you? He brought you to Victory Outreach. Because he said, you're a man that can't hold back. You're a woman that can't hold back. I have destiny placed over you. Don't hold back. Then it says, lengthen your cords. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. Pastor's been saying a lot about if we want to go higher, what do we got to do? Go deeper. And he's calling us deeper, church. He's calling us deeper because he wants to take us higher. But we must go deeper in Jesus. No more prayerlessness days. No more living in the flesh, listening to worldly music and, and acting all carnal. He's saying, I need a church that's going to go deeper in me. I need a church that's going to seek me. I need a church that I could place my anointing upon. I need a church that's going to be an extension of my love to a hurting city. God has given our church a mandate. This city is our assignment. The city of San Diego is our assignment to bring hope to this city, to bring hope to every hurting man, woman, and child that is out there right now in pain and in hurting. And you carry hope. You carry the answer. You carry the answer. But some of us, we got to awaken something inside of us. Some of us here this morning, you got to be delivered from the prison of offense. You got to be delivered from just it, everything being all about me. And lift up your eyes. What does the word of God say? Lift up your eyes. Look at the fields, for they are white and ready for harvest. But it says, lift up your eyes. Many of us have been looking down, looking at our phones. Down, looking down, looking down because we're insecure, looking down because we're just down on ourselves. We're down about our life. We're looking down and the word of God says, look up. Look up to me. Keep your eyes on me. Look up. Revival, I believe it. Revival is going to take place. But guess where revival starts? Revival starts in me and in you. Revival starts in our hearts. And guess what? Revival is like a fire. A contagious fire. When revival's in your heart, it's contagious. And you can't help but to share it. And this Easter, I want to see this place packed out. I want to see every one of the members of our church come with an army of people that need Jesus, that you have influenced to come, that you have brought to the feet of Jesus.